LexisNexis African Ancestry Network and LexisNexis Rule of Law Foundation Fellowship Panel. I am Rhonda Moore, Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer here at LexisNexis. And over the past two days, I've had the pleasure of joining an amazing group of people. Over the past nine months, we've had an extraordinary group of talented law school students from the six historically black colleges and universities with law schools journey with us to imagine how they might eliminate systemic racism in the legal system and advance the rule of law. And we've been together for a summit in New York City and we've been talking about ideas. We have celebrated that they are all published authors with LexisNexis and now we are at the end of our time together and they are ready to share their stories with you. So I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. You are in for a real treat. And I'd like to just personally again, extend my heartfelt congratulations to each of our fellows who have been extraordinary in every way imaginable. And now please allow me to introduce Adonica Black, who is our program director for this program in its inaugural year. Adonica has done an amazing job in leading this initiative, and it's my pleasure to introduce her to you now. Adonica. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today um, to virtually participate in our fellowship summit. I'm really excited to kick us off by sharing with you what we will be talking about today. So you'll see, I'm gonna give you an overview of the fellowship, what we've been working on for the last nine months of this year. And then I'm gonna show you a really exciting, inspiring video that encompasses all of the work our fellows have been doing. And then you will hear from the fellows themselves. They've been organized by cluster. And so you'll hear from them about the work that they've been doing in their cluster groups. And towards the end of our discussion and time together, we will have a moderated question and answer portion, portion available for the virtual audience. And then Rhonda Moore is going to give us our closing remarks. Everyone, please make sure you're muted so we don't get any feedback. Thank you. So I want to start by giving you all an overview of our fellowship. It's been an amazing journey. Like I said, we started nine months ago in March. This fellowship was born out of a partnership between the LexisNexis African Ancestry Network and the LexisNexis Rule of Law Foundation. Um, and they decided to develop a fellowship aimed at eliminating systemic racism and advancing the rule of law. This fellowship includes 12 law school students from the six HBCU law schools in our country. And each of these fellows have been awarded $10,000 as a tuition grant and the opportunity to work with LexisNexis technology and talent to advance eliminating systemic racism in our legal system. In this program, we've met since March through today on a twice monthly basis, and we've instituted cohort development sessions where we've shared with our fellows development in areas including analytics, data mining, marketing, project management, leadership skills, and so much more. We've also had our fellows paired with mentors throughout the organization who they've met with on a regular basis to develop their project platforms. So looking at the fellowship, we started in March and we've had this ongoing consistent work to deliver on the projects that you're gonna hear this afternoon. And we've also incorporated the talent of you all. Many of you have raised your hands and decided that you wanted to be a part of this initiative and this great work. You volunteered using the Rule of Law Foundation Project Board and you participated in making sure that this was a success. And I truly believe that we're just getting started with regard to advancing the mission of advancing the rule of law and eliminating systemic racism. Some of the amazing fellows you see here, um, all of them actually, have presented today at the summit, their capstone presentations, and they've gone just so in depth in ways that they've pushed thoughts forward in how to change our society for the better and to actually make it tangible and fruitful and renewable. 
So you'll see our fellows here and you'll hear from them all directly. You see also the mentors that they've been partnered with throughout the organization for this program. In the fellowship, we've taken a cluster approach. So I just wanna quickly explain what that means. The fellows have been paired in groups of three as clusters to systematically approach eliminating systemic racism. So they've approached the thought of how to deconstruct this system of oppression and build a new system of equity and inclusion in its place. And they've tackled it from four different perspectives, including making the legal practice more inclusive for practitioners, reforming the legislature and the judiciary in government, creating resources for people to be able to represent themselves equitably and effectively. And finally, diversifying who is being educated in the legal profession and being developed to make sure that we continue to create equitable opportunities for not just practitioners, but also the clients and the communities that they serve. So we've had this summit. It's been a wonderful two days. I wish I could share with you all virtually the feeling in the room, but I think you'll see it in the video that we have coming up for you. And I wanna just mention, there is a shorthand available online now, and someone's gonna be dropping a link in the chat for everyone that's joined us. So you can actually tune in and see a little bit more about the program, the summit we've had, more about our fellows and our mentors and our committee, and follow along on social media and in the press. And as I mentioned press, our fellows are now published authors as a result of this fellowship, um, actual published authors. So hopefully you can see this book that we have here that has been published as of yesterday, developing their findings. This is also available online in the shorthand. Um, it's also available on Lexis Plus. So they are already changing the legal system and Lexis. The fellows have also been featured on a Law 360 Pro Se podcast. You'll see them featured there. They've also been featured in Bloomberg Law News. There's an entire series being developed around the fellowship and making the law more equitable. Additionally, they have some, some additional <coughs> publications that have reached out to them. You'll find all of that in the shorthand. And so as I mentioned, they are featured in, Le in Lexis Plus. So if you want to tune in and virtually uh, um, access the publication. You can go to the Explore Content Pod on Lexus Plus under the Equal Justice Practice Area tab, and then you'll go ahead and select Eliminate Racism Legal Advocacy Papers for the Fellowship 2021. And that will open up the download to the full publication from our fellows. If you'd like to learn more, you wanna follow along, the Fellowship Summit has been amazing. We've had such a great time this week and there's so much content in our social media streams around this program. Please make sure to follow hashtag LN Fellowship and you'll get to see more of what we've done. So with that, I wanna go into sharing the video that I mentioned, a great overview of what we've accomplished in these nine months. I grew up in a small town and I saw where um, if you were from a certain side of the track, you didn't get treated um, as nice as people from the other side of the track. This is our criminal justice system. It's supposed to be here to serve all of us equally and it doesn't. And so whatever little bit that I can do to make it as equal as possible, that's what I want to do. We are righting wrongs and correcting transgressions of a system that has existed for the entirety of our nation's history. Lexus um, African Ancestry Network and our Rule of Law Foundation teamed up and they put together this fellowship from the six HBCU law schools. The fellowship is a program that consists of 12 law school students from the six HBCU law schools in the United States and fellows were selected from a large competitive applicant pool for this prestigious fellowship where they've been awarded $10,000 and the opportunity to work on projects 
that they've proposed to eliminate systemic racism in the legal system. One of the things that we wanted to do with the LexisNexis partnership is just really open up the opportunity for students to have access to the incredible resources of LexisNexis in terms of doing broader research that really focus on diversity in the profession. My project deals with the underrepresentation of women of color, particularly black women, in leadership roles across law firms. We're doing papers of publishable quality related to our research. It's important and definitely necessary that our work was of publishable quality because then this research can be used to further the areas that we're all kind of approaching. I'm surrounded by individuals who you can just see that they're achieving at a high level um, at their institutions, their ideas are just mind-blowing in, in the topics that they are tackling and the problems that they are tackling. The best part of this fellowship so far has been just meeting such wonderful people, meeting other students from law school that are just as bright and ambitious as I am, meeting the LexisNexis employees who are so helpful and so generous, and they seem to be really invested in my success. This fellowship celebrates everything that makes LexisNexis special, which is our people who are inspired to advance the rule of law. I was given the opportunity to present to all of the deans of the law schools involved in the fellowship. I realized we've been able to do so much. I, I've been able to connect with really awesome people. My mentor for the program is the vice president for Law360, and that is just incredible and the way that she has helped me develop my project, the way she's helped me think about it, was all reflected in that presentation. Working at Law360 and with LexisNexis, our purpose has always been to support the rule of law throughout the globe. Being part of this fellowship alongside the Rule of Law Foundation has really meant for me that we can sort of move past good intention and really start taking action. And it's felt real, it's felt practical. The endeavor into the law and, and graduating and passing the bar, um, in my opinion, will essentially change my family tree. It will change the trajectory and the, the, the boundaries that uh, we may have set for ourselves based on those around us and our family backgrounds. Our fellows are leaving a legacy and I believe that the work that they're doing now will be looked upon as really heroic in the years to come. And I'm so privileged that LexisNexis gets to be a part of that journey with them. Ending systemic racism um, is going to be something that we need to be committed to for a long, long time. And so having dedicated people taking on these projects in new ways and bringing in new ideas uh, to the fellowship will be something that we'll look forward to with great interest. I would describe the fellowship as challenging, creative, and hopeful. Fellowship is inspiring, challenging, and most importantly, exciting. The fellowship is a uniquely transformative opportunity hardworking, striving for success, eliminating systemic racism. I would describe the program as life-changing work. The fellowship is prolific, profound, and powerful. So hopefully you all got a taste of just how excited we are. So now we're gonna go ahead and talk to the fellows directly. We're gonna have a moderated discussion with our fellows um, by cluster. So in order to facilitate this moderated discussion, we have Wendy Gates Corbett joining us to review with our fellows. So we're gonna start with our first cluster, the Inclusive Legal Practices Cluster. It is my pleasure to introduce the profound, prolific and powerful cluster that includes Charles Graham, Caitlin Kennedy, and Pearl Mansu. Charles, let's start with you.
You can go ahead, Charles. Go ahead, Charles. Introduce yourself to us. Hello, my name is Charles Graham Jr. I'm a 3L at Thurgood Marshall School of Law in Houston, Texas. Um, and I'm a part of the Inclusive Legal Practices Cluster. Kaylin? Hi, everyone. Hi. My, my name, name is... Go ahead. My name is Kaylin Kennedy. Um, I'm a 3L at North Carolina Central University School of Law, and I'm also a part of the Inclusive Legal Practice Cluster. Pearl Mansu. Hi there, as you just heard, I am Pearl Mansu, and I am a 3L at the University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law. So this legal, uh, this cluster focused on identifying that the legal profession is racially inclusive, uninclusive. They created projects and researched ways to amplify the voices of minority attorneys by looking at how um, compensation structures are racially biased, how we can create more equitable access to leadership opportunities and create meaningful ways to start the work of eliminating rate, systemic racism in the legal community. Charles, tell us a little bit about your project. Yeah, so my project focused on um, compensation and focused on the partner diversity gap that exists. So I tried to tackle that problem by looking at how compensation models and compensation practices um, impact diversity at large law firms. And what did you find? What I found out was that, am I control? Mm -hmm. oh. Go ahead, Charles. So I want to I want, I want to start with why I chose this topic. So I chose this topic because compensation opens doors, right? And I saw this firsthand as a young boy watching my father grow his own um, his own business, his own small business, a shoe repair business. And he started this business because systemic racism slammed so many doors shut in his face that you know he decided to build his own door. And so with that, I decided Um, I, I decided to start with this project because I'm soon to be an associate at a large law firm, and I want to make sure that doors are open for me and that I'm also able to hold that door open for other associates of color coming through the ranks. And so here's an overview of my project. So the issue that I tackled was partner diversity gap, as I said. And the methodology that I used to attack this problem was by analyzing diversity um, data that already existed. And this data came from MCCA, Law 360, um, the Vault, as well as now. And after that, I developed my own independent survey and collected quantitative data from various law firms. And at the end of all of that, I cross-referenced everything to see if there were any correlations between the compensation models and practices that these firms were using and the um, diversity that existed at these firms. And the results from that were that um, some recommendations that were published in the publication that we talked about, as you can see here. What I learned was compensation practices increase par that increased partner diversity include tracking origination credits, diverse attorneys on partner promotion committees, and billable hours for DEI work. What you see here is um, that law firms that have more than 10% partners of color had 1.25 times more, well, they were 1.25 times more likely to track origination credits. They were also about two times more likely to allow DEI work to serve as billable hours. And they also, on average, had about 2.5 times more attorneys of color on their partner promotion committees. And these were going a long way towards closing that, that um, partner diversity gap. And I want to leave everyone with this quote. This is my favorite quote of all time. 
I have learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And with that, I just reflect on this project that, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, a lot of law firms made a lot of public statements and said a lot of, th a lot of good things about supporting the black community. They also did a lot of things and I benefited from that by having the opportunity to summer at a, at a law firm. And in time, people will forget these things. What's gonna last is law firms creating change that's gonna make associates of color feel as though they are welcome, valued, and supported within the legal industry. Amazing work, Charles. Now I wanna introduce Pearl Mansu, who is gonna talk a little bit more about um, specifically black women in law firm partnership. Pearl, tell us a little bit about your project. Absolutely. And so as you just said, Wendy, um, my project was focused, it, it's in par, it's on par with Charles's project as well in, in that it involves inclusive legal practices, but it honed in on black women partnership across the US and the factors that affect why it's so low, because the current number as of 2018, the current percentage was 0.7%, which is abysmal, um, not even a full percent. Um, so for me, going into um, you know, law firms after graduation and looking at well, what are my odds of becoming you know, a partner um, at law firms, and this is what I'm looking at, which is not acceptable in any way. And so I developed a, a survey um, designed for Black women, um, just engaged at figuring out how women of color who are attorneys, Black women specifically, who are attorneys, how they perceive and how they define inclusive and in diverse spaces. And then also figuring out the factors um, that play a role in this low number and how to increase that number. Um, and as a result, as you heard in the publication that we released as a fellowship, I was able to, to release some, some overviews of ways to overcome the hurdle. And this involves compensation and growth opportunities, increasing those, and also increasing firm relationships um, because those we found out were telltale signs in the low number of, um, of you know, Black women partners across the country. And so as we move on to the next slide, I'm gonna go to some of the, the results that came from, um, from the survey. And as we move on, we found out that 83% of black women respondents um, who are attorneys, of course, can usually tell the difference between in a firm that's saying that diversity and inclusion are important to them and those who actually mean it. And so on the next slide, you'll see the metrics that black women use to gauge, you know, who means it and who doesn't mean it. And from that, um, when we go on on, on the slide, you'll see in front of you that 50% we're going to go ahead and back up to some of the, the slides that we have before showing the graphs. But essentially, when it comes down to tying this 50% called out, you know, the, the diversity of staff, having diverse, uh, you know, uh, people at every level of, of hierarchy across a firm, not just the low levels, of course, also the high levels, we want to know that. Um, and so in addition to that, another metric that people, Black women pointed out were policies that favored not just a Eurocentric view, but are also an Afrocentric view. Policies like, do you consider me wearing my Afro as unprofessional dress in your, at your firm? Um, or is it something that I can do and still be myself and come to work and be recognized for who I am and the work that I, that I bring in? And not, you know, the fact that my hair naturally grows a certain way. Um, we found ultimately that 83% of Black women attorneys are willing to tolerate non-inclusive, non-diverse firms, but only to a certain extent, only to the point where they can take care of financial obligations and then they are gone. So we find that for firms that are not inclusive, for firms that are not diverse, the, there's a time clock and that it's ticking fast until I can pay off my student loans or whatever other financial obligations I have, and then I'm gone. So what this does is that this limits the time span. You know, I from my, my colleague's presentation, from Charles's presentation, um, you know, we found that the, the timeline of becoming a partner is eight to 10 years. Many people are just not going to tolerate uninclusive, you know, uh, 
conditions for that long. And that's a huge factor. And so synoptic recommendations come down to making sure that we, we do have racially inclusive spaces by increasing compensation, equal compensation and recognition. Also having diverse um, a, a workforce that's diverse at every level of, of hierarchy, also recruiting that's not traditional, going out to HBCUs to recruit. And finally, you know, maintaining internal and external modes of establishing relationships across the firm for black, black women who want to be attorneys, who want to become partners rather. Such powerful work, Pearl. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> what this cluster found is that when um, attorneys of color are able to get together, get into law firms, there is their experience is something that not many people can relate to. So Caitlin Kennedy created a space where attorneys of color can come together and speak honestly um, about their experience and ask the questions that they're afraid to ask anywhere else. Caitlin, tell us about your project. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I can hear you. You got to stay muted. We can hear you. Okay. Um, so yes, what I created was a web show um, called Legal Vision that launches to the YouTube channel. Um, it allows me to be a little more creative with the content, so allowing like a QR code, um, so that you know we can have conver hard conversations, communicate, um, communicate, uh, solve problems, and you know have this QR code so that other people can, you know, ask questions and honestly. And what I've done with this platform is I've created three episodes. Um, my last episode will actually launch November 17th, but it deals around employment in the legal community. So I wanted to get down to the nitty gritty and basically have like a red table talk version, but with the legal community. What? Can you tell us what led you to want to create this platform? Um, yes, so um, the reason why I created this was because of my mom. Um, I'm biracial and my mom is white. And so I asked her like, you know, what do you want to see? Because she didn't understand like what during the Black Lives Matter movement, like why I was upset or why I was crying. And I told her that like, it affects me and she didn't see that because you know I'm just her daughter so my mom like she was like I don't know how to ask the questions I don't know what to look for I'm scared to ask because I don't want people to feel offended and so I asked her what did she want to see and she was like I, I need the communication I need to be able to ask without feeling like you know I, I'm being judged or you know like getting backlash from it so this is why I created and uh, it is a powerful platform. I wanna invite all of you um, to, to tune in on November 12th at 9 a.m. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, this is just a you know, mock-up of what it would look like on the flyer, um, but it's November 17th at 6.30. Um, yes, please tune in on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. This cluster has um, made significant strides in um, identifying practices that can make legal practices more inclusive. Thank you to all of you for the work that you have done and the differences you are making. Our second cluster is uh, a cluster that focused on creating legislative and judicial reform. This cluster includes Ebony Cormier, Babin Johannes, and Darnell Terry Andrews. We are going to start with Ebony, with Miss Ebony Cormier. Ebony, tell us about your project. Sure, and thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so my project was the Equality Bail Fund, and it was created to address inequities in the cash bail system. 
So I researched existing bail commissions and I found staggering numbers, like 66% of people in jail today have not been convicted of a crime. They're sitting in jail pretrial with the presumption of innocence, but they cannot afford to pay their bail. Of that 60%, 43% are black. The Equality Bail Fund was created to provide equity in the cash bail system. The bail system was supposed to be to protect our communities and prevent flight risk for those who were arrested. But now it seems to become a system that disproportionately disadvantages impoverished people, especially if you're a minority. The Equality Bail Fund will serve as a conduit for equality in a broken bail system. Now, as a result of my research, I published best practices to address inequities in the bail system which includes community involvement, legal pro bono assistance, and corporate dollars to sponsor initiatives such as these. I was also able to raise capital and identify an existing bail fund to, don to donate to. Thank you to LexisNexis. Thanks to LexisNexis, I was able to donate $2,500 to a Chicago community bail fund. Now, the next steps include launching the National Equality Bail Fund as a conduit to feed into local bail funds that are already doing the work, as well as fill the void where there is no fund available. Now, my recommendation going forward is to target corporations who find value in this work. It's been an uphill battle trying to change minds, and so we don't want to do that. We want to focus on the people that's already on board and that's willing to open up their pocketbooks. And like some of my colleagues said before, during the Black Lives Matter movement, there was a lot of talk on social media and press releases and all of these things that corporations and law firms said they wanted to do, and now it's a chance to put, put your money where your mouth is. Beautiful. Beautiful. So Ebony's project focused on creating um, creating something tactical, something financial, financial resources for um, for a bail fund. Beyond this, there's also a need for legislative reform. So um, our next speaker is Darnell Terry Andrews' project, and speaking on behalf of of Darnell is Terry Jennings, her mentor. Thank you so much, Wendy. It has been an honor to work with all of the fellows here, and particularly Darnell Terry Andrews, who's a third year law student at Southern University Law Center. Darnell started this journey by writing an essay about a, uh, an individual that she knew while in college. And I'm gonna call the individual Terry. Terry was poor. She went to the store, but she didn't have a ride. She needed to go to the store. And so she caught a ride with individuals who then shoplifted. Terry was thrown into jail because the individuals who shoplifted were not poor. They were released on bail, but Terry was not. She spent over a month and up to two months in jail, innocent. And what Darnell wanted to do was look at the system and change the laws that would allow this inequity to happen. She started with Congress, which is a big bite at a very, very large apple. And with the tools of StateNet and Lexis Plus, she and a wonderful team of dedicated volunteers researched the state laws and found out that certain states like Illinois and New Jersey had passed legislation in a very comprehensive fashion. 800 pages worth of comprehensive. What Darnell decided to do was look at her own home state of Louisiana, where she grew up, where she is going to school, and where she is a constituent. And when she dug into the statistics related to Louisiana, it was indeed shocking to her. You're much more likely to be in jail. And our colleague Ebony had said, if you're in jail, and of color and poor, you're much more likely to not be able to leave jail. And so working with the Uniform Law Commission Model Act, Darnell figured that there are certain things that keep people in jail. A bail schedule means that just because you've committed a felony, you do not get out. There needs to be a balance of the risk to the community and your ability to pay. 
And so what Darnell did was using the Model Act, placed into the Louisiana statutes, her idea of where to make changes to the law. Two of those would be minimizing the amount of time you're in jail before you're brought in front of someone to talk about pretrial release. That is not consistent across the states and it's not articulated in Louisiana. She put in a standard of 48 hours, two days. There is also a provision about when you get counsel. So if you are in your hearing to get pretrial release and you are poor and you cannot afford a lawyer, one would think that a lawyer would accompany you to that important hearing where your fate is decided. Unfortunately, that does not yet occur in Louisiana specifically. And so she placed that into the Louisiana statute. We used the report on the Louisiana bail system. We determined individuals who care about this issue deeply and who are planning to work with us. What Darnell then did was work with state representative Mandy Landry, who has decided that she would like to pre-file Darnell's concept with input from sheriffs, public defenders, prosecutors, and others. There's an important picture that is that is that speaks to Darnell, and it's a familiar one if you play Monopoly. When you get that get out of jail free card, you know you're in a good place. In the US system, there is an, uh, a presumption of innocence before pro being proven guilty. And Darnell, with her project, attempts to bring that back. Thank you. What a great project. And I think, Terry, I think the, your key word in your presentation is yet. It's not there yet, but um, Darnell's um, project is making huge strides to bring it uh, to bring it to life and to get it on the books. So Darnell's project focused on um, legislative reform related to bail. I'm now going to introduce Faven Johannes, who is also looking at, at legislative reform, this time related to evictions. Faven, tell us about your project. Hi, everyone. My name is Faven, and I'm a 2L at Howard Law. And my project focused on judicial bias best practices. And so I want to start with a definition of judicial bias that was kind of working for my project. And it related to the unconscious and conscious biases present when making judicial determinations in the court. And so the methodology of my project focused on collaborating with Lex Machina to create a database related to evictions appeals cases in Harris County, Texas. And so with the Lex Machina team and I, we kind of collaborated to work together to manually enter thousands of cases related to information such as zip code, pro se status, days to trial, damages, and other factors, and we looked at these trends and analyzed them to come to a number of conclusions based on how the different factors correlated. And so we researched the role of bias, and I was also able to work with judges in the Harris County courtrooms directly to see firsthand what their perspective on the topic of judicial bias looked like. And so based on this, I was able to come to the conclusion that there is a huge issue with access to justice and representation. And a lot of litigants are entering courtrooms without access to a lawyer. And because of this, there's a huge disparity between the amount of damages we're being required to pay. And so ultimately, I realized that the first step in combating judicial bias is continuing to improve metrics in our courtrooms to better assess what's going on in our system. And I was able to use the information from my database to work directly with Judge Williams in Harris County to start the beginnings of potentially creating legal clinics at HBCUs and Texas law schools to kind of pave the way to creating better representation for tenants entering evictions appeals courtrooms. Additionally, I was able to secure funding to thanks to LexisNexis or the Houston Coalition for the Homeless to have legal representation for individuals entering our courtrooms as well. And so although there needs to be more research done in this area, and I hope to in the future look at factors such as race, economic status, educational background, and other things like that, that it was clear from the research that I did in this short amount of time that representation and damages and pro se status are key factors. And so looking at all of this information and why it matters is because 
housing is my story, your story, and our story. And after the expiration of the COVID-19 moratorium, evictions are only going to be more prominent in our society. And it's important that we address this. And as we've seen with my colleagues' presentations, inaction can lead to something catastrophic like the situation related to Khalif Browder and Terry's college, the access to college and you know the pipeline in our system. So overall, I hope to create reform using this data set. This data set is the beginning of incredible work uh, that will make substantial differences. This cluster has done tremendous work um, to, towards <laughs> legislative reform. Thank you to all of you for the work that you've done and the difference that you're making. Our next cluster focuses on the diversification of legal education and profession pipeline. Um, it includes three people who focused on different, different parts of the pipeline to get into law school successfully through and graduate law school and into um, successful productive careers as attorneys. We're gonna start with Jamal Bailey. Jamal, tell us about your project. Thank you, Wendy. Um, am I good? Am yeah, good? You're fine, go ahead. Um, so Jamal Bailey, I'm a third year attending UDC David A. Clark School of Law. And uh, my project, comes you know directly from my own uh, personal struggles to apply to law school um i remember um working full-time and when i made the affirmative decision that i'm going to go to law school i had such a difficulty finding information and then once i f figured out the information to actually search for then deadlines had already passed and then if the deadline hadn't passed there was a steep fee associated with let's say lsat prep you know, and then application fees after you took the LSA and stuff like that. So um, the basis of my project is essentially testing the thesis that systemic racism in the legal profession begins at the law school application process. So um, this slide here is just a couple of facts about me and proud to say I'm a newly published author. <laughs> <laughs> uh, revisiting kind of this concept of, you know, the myth of meritocracy, like it's this idea that you know, which through our standardized testing systems, uh, if I score, you know, X on whichever exam, you know, that entitles me to Y uh, in the profession. So that 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 idea of quote unquote merit is actually steeped in privilege and entitlement. You know, we see that on a day to day basis. So kind of getting into, um, I think I'm good. So kind of getting into like the actual mechanics of the project, uh, this isn't a new issue. It's not, you know, it's not a novel issue and my solutions aren't new, you know, to be quite frank. However, this is the first time that this has been visited post George Floyd. This is the first time it's been visited when we have law firms, you know, journalists, articles, and these big companies screaming from the 50th floor that we need diversity. Diversity, diversity, diversity. We're going to, we're going to, launch these lofty goals of you know 1000 diverse candidates you know in the next 10 years or something like that without acknowledging the complete strangle and shackle on you know the resource pool at its beginning so in a three-step approach um i decided to uh, try to gather this information through you know scholastic research your j story your google scholar and lexus nexus of course and our uh, legal databases um, interviews actually with law school admission officers to get the kind of the one-on-one -on -one qualitative uh, experience. And then from the quantitative side, we rolled out a survey um, targeting, uh, can we go back? Mm -hmm. Or is that me? Nope, you're good. Sorry. Uh, targeting, you know, specifically our students at our HBCU law schools, just to see if my story, you know, was the exception or was it the rule. And and very unfortunate news is definitely the general situation for a lot of people like myself that are first generation, you know, college grads and first generation law will be first generation law school grads. Um, and and kind of just reviewing, you know, what we were able to get out of this, uh, raising awareness for the inequities. Uh, I'm also proud to say we were just featured on a podcast, Law 360's uh, Pro Se. Uh, being able to amplify our voices, speaking there, sharing the message, 
uh, gaining meaningful insight from the admissions officers and getting their take, their understanding of, okay, this is the data. This is how, you know, when you actually interpret this into information, how it's disproportionately affecting people like myself and how the cries for diversity essentially ring hollow because you can't cry for diversity yet cut the pool off at his knees. And then, you know, also, like like I said, y'all, I'm published. I don't, I don't know how many people <laughs> on this Zoom can say that. You know, I don't know if that's regular, but, you know, I'm literally a published author. So those, 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 those accomplishments... Those accomplishments are, you know, big in my world, but also uh, looking towards next steps. They laid the foundation and the infrastructure to our next group of uh, fellowship members, you know, the next cohort. So, like, really come in and be able to take this, you know, essentially pulling all of these pieces from several different directions. And then you have a prepackaged plan for, all right, this is how you roll this out. You know, juxtapose the information that I found from this HBCU law school admission officers with top 14, you know, compare the information that I found from our HBCU first generation law students with, you know, third, fourth generation Harvard. And let's just see how the numbers play out to tell a more full story. Um, next slide, please. So again, um, I would be remiss, you know, we talk about next steps as if everything went you know, in a beautiful path. It was very, 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 very difficult figuring out how best to gather this data, figuring out the questions, figuring out where to go, figuring out, you know, the best way to approach this. Um, one of my favorite quotes, uh, even from X Candy and how to be anti-racist, you can't you can't dismantle the master's house by using the master's tools. You can't, you know, so on its face, it would be a very convenient shorthand argument to say, the LSAT disproportionately affects our minorities. Let's cut the LSAT altogether. You know, that's what a lot of people say, but that's not the root of the problem. You know what I mean? In order to attack the root of the problem, I can't argue on its face. So I had to pull in several other different pieces, you know, so actually figuring out the survey methodology and then getting people to take it. <laughs> you know, everybody's a law student. Everybody's busy. We rolled this out, I think, at the top of October. That's midterm season. You know, folks are super busy, so getting responses and quantifying them. And then lastly, I got a lot of pushback from admissions officers, like a lot, you know, like a lot more than, you know, because in a politically correct corporate situation, everybody, you know, wants to smile, be friendly, be helpful. But like when I really put these numbers and started uh, adding the data behind it and showing the story that it created and how you can't put on your website that you want diversity, yet you're, you know, immediately cutting applicants that are below a certain LSAT number, you know, because looking at our medians, I think the Black national average is 142 is the LSAT. You know, Black men specifically is 138. Latin X uh, is like 143, 144, you know, and then we got these law schools cutting pools starting at 149 or below. So all that being said, um, this was great. This was a great experience. And I was really just the first leg in this race for diversifying the legal profession. So true, Jamal. This is such a, um, an important first leg that is laying a foundation for so much more work to help um, create more equity in getting into and access to law school. Once you get into law school, there are um, additional steps that need to be taken to make sure that, uh, that law students of color can succeed in law school and graduate so that they can enter um, the legal field. And Paris Molay created an, um, a project to focus on how to help law students of color be more successful in law school. Paris, tell us about your project. Thanks, Wendy. So um, just a little bit about myself. My name is Ferris Malay. I graduated from the Prairie View A&M University, and I'm currently a third year law student at Thurgood Marshall School of Law. And so um, the heart behind this project was that I myself was um, a part of a pre-law project at the University of Houston. And through that program, um, they assisted me with LSAT prep through Princeton Review. Um, we actually had the admissions board overview our resume. Um, I had law school professors help me prepare my personal statement. 
Um, and they also took us to these big firms. And so the program overall basically prepared me to get into law school. And I would not be here without a program like that. And so I myself, when I think about eliminating systemic racism in the legal profession, I think of first targeting, you know, how do I get people like me into law school? And so I wanted to develop a program just like that. So I first started reaching out to um, those top LSAT companies. So your companies like PowerScore, um, Kaplan, just to name a few. And um, I can't say that there were any pushback. They actually did want to partner with programs like mine and actually give back. And so I'm proud to say that PowerScore has partnered with us and they're willing to um, give participants the course at a discounted rate. Um, however, I'm working diligently to um, get funds so that those students can actually get those programs for free. Um, I also work with some of the top bar exam companies like Barbary and Kaplan. Um, I've met with those people and they were too excited to hear what I had to offer and basically, you know, contributing to um, helping to end systemic racism and ultimately increase the amount of African-American attorneys um, in America. And so they offered to offer programs at a discounted rate or even Kaplan um, told me that they would match any funds that I got from large law firms. And so some of the next steps that we're going to be taking first is just establishing a 501c3 so that way I can, you know, get a design going, launch a website so that way students have somewhere to actually go see what this program is all about and see what we have to offer. Um, through this program, I actually figured out that there was a component that I was missing and that needed to be put in place. And that's help while you're in law school. You can go back. And that's help while you're in law school. Um, I think that, you know, you have to get in, you have to stay in, and then you have to get out. And so I hope that the next cohort can probably do something like guidance through law school, you know, helping people how to brief a case, um, how, to how to properly study, um, how to take exams, um, what to do when your professor is calling on you and dealing with the Socratic method. Um, some of those things that I um, got to get from mentors and people who have already been through law school or were there while, while I was there. Um, and so just some of the next steps, just making sure we get some of those donations from those large law firms and corporation um, so that we can fund these participants. Okay, next slide. Um, and so something that I just wanted to always take with me um, and that I just had to remember while I was here at the program is that I always have to reach back and, and pull those that are coming behind me and uplift them because they're going to be following in my footsteps. And I didn't get here alone by myself. There were people who helped me and put me on their shoulders. And someone told us early, earlier that we're standing on the shoulders of warriors. And so um, this picture here to me, it just signifies, you know, the legal profession and us just crossing this bridge and just trying to make sure that everyone gets across so that we can ultimately end systemic racism in the legal profession. And Paris, your uh, your project is going to help so many more people cross this successfully cross that gap um, and become successful legal professionals. So we've looked at how to get into law school, how to um, deal with um, systemic racism in law school, and create projects, create programs that help um, help people get into and through law school. We know that one of the uh, one of the big hurdles that people face is not being able to get a job unless they have experience, but needing experience in order to get a job. Um, so Herb Brown is his project focuses on ways to overcome those hurdles so that the law school students coming out of law school have a better opportunity for better jobs. Herb, tell us about your project. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so my project is called HB6U Law Practice Pipeline, and I chose HB6U to highlight the fact that uh, of, of the HBCUs, the uh, number of HBCUs in the country, only six of them um, have a law school. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I brought awareness to that, um, as well as uh, promote this project. And so what HB6U is designed to do is to create dedicated internship and externship slots for these six law schools. And so we're um, requesting and, and, and uh, approaching large corporations and large firms um, to come on board 
partner with us and dedicate slots each year um, to these six law schools in order so that um, these the students at these schools are able to get that experience um, that usually or could very likely matriculate into um, postgraduate employment. And so it, it's very it's very vital that um, that students of color are, are allowed uh, to get experience in uh, non-traditional legal settings. Uh, very often we're kind of pigeonholed into criminal law or civil rights. Um, and that's not the totality of what it means to be an attorney of color or what it means to be an advocate uh, for the minority populations, uh, economic justice, protecting um, uh, black business owners and entertainers and, and the like uh, is just as important um, on the financial side, protecting generational wealth is just as important as protecting civil rights and, and, and uh, criminal defense. So <clears throat> again, the systemic race issue that I, that I chose to tackle was access to experiential learning and employment opportunities. Um, we created a conceptual framework for this uh, rollout for the uh, dedicated internship slots, engage some key stakeholders uh, and pitch to a few different organizations. Uh, through that process, we were able to secure partnership with CLEO, the Council on Legal Education Opportunity, who has agreed to house and facilitate uh, the HB6U program and also to uh, approach their donor base, um, which is a large corporate donor base, uh, to begin uh, dedicating those particular internship slots to these six schools. And so next steps for HB6U, of course, uh, the goal right now is to secure the first six pilot slots for summer 2022. That way we can work out the kinks um, with a small group uh, before we scale the, the, the program. Um, and then next would be to identify um, funding, uh, identifying and funding certification and training programs um, that will also uh, help these uh, participants be more uh, marketable in the job in the job field. Um, establish the vetting standards, right? What do the corporations want to see in a student? Um, and then begin recruiting and, and launch the program in summer of 2022. Herb, you're doing amazing work. All three of, of um, these students are focused on making sure that students of color can get into law school, have the access and resources they need to get into law school, to thrive and successfully graduate law school, and, um, and get successful, productive employment uh, once they graduate. You are all doing amazing work, and I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Our last cluster focuses on um, the idea that, uh, that there is bias in the legal system, specifically when it comes to self-service solutions. Um, there are, are, there's bias when people, there is in, um, in equitable, that's the word, inequitable access to resources. So this last cluster, is includes Amani Robertson, Oscar Drawn, and Shayla McIntyre. Their projects focus on different aspects of, of ways that people can help themselves. Our first uh, presenter is Imani Robertson. Her project focuses on ways that um, people can learn more about bankruptcy options. Imani, tell us about your project. Hi, everyone. My name is Imani Robertson. I am a 3L at Howard University School of Law and truly um, honored to talk about my project today, um, which is reducing racial bias and consumer bankruptcy. This project was inspired by a plethora of research that I had come across in the past year, highlighting how Blacks, specifically African Americans, are disproportionately um, encouraged to file one chapter choice in comparison to another. Uh, specifically chapter 13. So just to really quickly explain the difference, a chapter seven, it's a petition that is filed, also known as a liquidation. It takes place over a course of six months. You pay attorney's fees up front and you're likely to have all of your debts discharged. Chapter 13, on the other hand, is likely to take upwards of five years and you don't pay money up front. But also a lot of your debts aren't just discharged and you're worse off than when you started the initial bankruptcy. At this point, I'm guessing you're 
figuring out which one African Americans are encouraged to file. Um, the data shows that African Americans are twice as likely encouraged to file a chapter 13. Uh, the numbers that I used and I found repeatedly were around 54.6%. Um, in comparison to their white counterparts, Asian counterparts, and Latino counterparts, who were all uh, filing chapter 13s at about 23 to 25%. And so what I really wanted to tackle was reducing the bias, but it's a very multifaceted issue, and you can tackle it from the client perspective, the attorney perspective, the judges, the U.S. trustees. So I thought, why don't we start with the attorneys who have a direct hand in helping their clients uh, file but for bankruptcy, but also have the ethical duties under our model rules of professional conduct to ensure that their clients are well off and, and well informed. So I reached out to a ton of attorneys, um, specifically through LexisNexis's newsletters, one, the bankruptcy newsletter and the consumer protection newsletter. Over 277,000 newsletters were sent to subscribers for bankruptcy and over 230,000 newsletters to the consumer protection folks. And what we found were two things, the same things I saw that inspired the project. One, a lot of people had no idea that uh, this level of racial bias existed, partially because bankruptcy is one area of law that does not track race. Um, so a lot of this data comes from demographic information that you can find um, by sociologists. And also, um, the other thing was this attitude of, I'm just doing what my client wants and it's not my job. Um, to, to give them much more. And so I worked very closely with my mentor to come up with a few solutions. One is just general awareness. I think getting this information in people's face um, is, is pertinent. Every time someone hears this presentation, they're even more shocked to hear that this began in 2007, 2021, and people are still learning about this. Um, and, and secondly, really having a targeted approach. So one, uh, creating a checklist that incorporates a race conscious series of questions um, and, and similar similarities and differences for chapter sevens versus chapter 13s that will encourage practitioners to really think about if their clients will be better off at the end of their bankruptcy petition, will it be dismissed uh, or should they have avoided the system altogether? And then a con continuing legal education course that encourages practitioners to be a part of the solution and not the problem, not to ignore it um, and to want better for individuals. So I end with this quote that it, it speaks volumes and it basically says that you cannot change uh, people. If you, you cannot have progress if you don't change people's minds. But I simply say, if you don't have have the information to change their minds, they will believe that there's progress necessary to be had. Yeah. Amani, your project is focusing on creating those resources and that information so that we can change minds. Um, very powerful, um, insightful work. Thank you. Our next presenter is Oscar Drawn. Oscar's project focuses on people who uh, providing resources for people who um, decide to represent themselves. Oscar, tell us about your project. Good afternoon. My name is Oscar Drawn, as just mentioned. I'm a student at Florida A&M University College of Law. My mentor is Serena Wellen, and my project focuses on mitigating the effects of appearing pro se or without the assistance of counsel in misdemeanor courts in Orange County, Florida. Next slide, please. <clears throat> you might be asking yourself why misdemeanor courts and this issue important. Well, the right misdemeanor or collective misdemeanors uh, can result in an individual having uh, significant barriers in obtaining safe housing, uh, obtaining gainful employment, uh, obtaining financial assistance so that you can attend college. Uh, in extreme cases, you also might find yourself being deported uh, and sent back to a country that you may have worked so hard to escape. Uh, so to tackle this issue, uh, we'll jump into what we did. So we researched and analyzed misdemeanor court data, uh, process data in Orange County, Florida. Um, we also surveyed misdemeanor defendants who appeared without the assistance of counsel. Uh, this was really a pivotal and important step uh, because we didn't want to create something that did not have the actual users in mind. We wanted their first take, their experience on what they experienced, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, so that we could provide something that would help them in the future. Uh, also, we interviewed Orange County court personnel. We spoke with the clerk of courts. We also spoke with the sitting judge, and they provided us with some additional insight uh, because it, although it was important, 
that we got the uh, insight from individuals who experienced this from the defendant side. We also needed to know what the practitioners felt, what they perceived and what they weighed into making the decisions that they did. Uh, we also identify ways uh, to mitigate these harmful effects of appearing without, uh, without the assistance of counsel. Uh, so what did we find? Uh, we found that in Orange County, approximately 58% of the defendants were represented by a public defender. And there were another 13% that were represented by private counsel. Thus, there were tens of thousands of defendants who appeared without the assistance of counsel for a myriad of reasons. The statistics also show that over 80% of criminal cases in the state of Florida and their misdemeanor courts are misdemeanors. Furthermore, a large portion of these individuals are transient, so they fail to appear, and this further complicates their situation because now they have an additional warrant that's issued for their arrest. Additionally, these defendants that are facing the possibility of incarceration, they proceed without the assistance of counsel at their peril. They possess minimal knowledge about the criminal court processes, and prosecutors have little to any reason or incentive to engage in any type of meaningful conversations with these individuals. Thus, we identified two ways where a significant impact could be made. The first of which is to funnel pro se defendants to uh, possibly uh, sign up, uh, get notifications via our app, or also if they were facing the possibility of incarceration, we wanted to go ahead and si get them signed up uh, and possibly take on a public defender. Uh, because as we know as minorities, there are a lot of negative connotations that we hold uh, for individuals that work in the legal field. Uh, some of them may be warranted, others may be not, but we do know that individuals that fall in these categories, uh, they are uh, really at a, at a detriment if they proceed to, to go through these processes without assistance of counsel. So with the help of my illustrious and hardworking Lexus engineers and my mentor who pushed me and, and provided all the resources that I could imagine throughout this process, uh, we created a prototype and this prototype was uh, user tested, uh, again, with them in mind so that we could make sure that we created something that they could, they could use. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a, a, a snapshot of the process. Um, as you can see, we have some wire, fr wire frames to your far left. Uh, those drawings aren't mine. You wouldn't be able to recognize it if it was. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see the, how skilled the design team was. Uh, those are the drawings, some of the ideas that we did. Uh, this is the first time I did something called a design sprint, and that was uh, what we came up with. Uh, the next step is we came up with uh, a prototype that and we started discussing ideas of, of what it would look like. And to the far right, that's the, the prototype, the design prototype that was uh, created. Uh, that's the prototype that was beta tested with the users in mind. Uh, and most importantly today, I'm happy to say that uh, in addition to the, the beta proto design prototype, we also created a prototype that the engineers have been working on. Uh, and in the future, uh, we hope to get this out to all of the pro se defendants throughout the country uh, so that we can start mitigating and helping these individuals. And it's really important area. This, this tool is really important because it can level the playing field and misdemeanor courts throughout, throughout the country. Uh, it, is, it is noteworthy that this isn't something that's only occurring in Orange County, Florida. Uh, as we heard with one of the prior uh, presentations, we have some jurisdictions where the right to counsel isn't always guaranteed. Uh, we also saw an, saw an example of the negative effects and how detrimental it could be if you appear without the assistance of counsel when there are landlord tenant issues. And as we know, the moratorium due to COVID is, is expiring. So we can only imagine what this situation is going to look like for these individuals who attempt to enter criminal and civil courts throughout this country without the assistance of legal counsel. So I thank you for your time. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and pass on the presentation to our next cohort member. Thank you. Oscar, this is going to make a huge difference to uh, be an incredible ally for thousands and thousands of people. A huge difference. Thank you. Our last cohort presenter is Shayla McIntyre. Shayla focused her project on what the experience is for attorneys of color in law firms. Shayla, tell us about your project. Thank you, Wendy. My name is Shayla McIntyre, and I am a third year law student at FAMU College of Law. My project focuses on systemic racism in law firms and legal organizations. Racism is ingrained in social and professional entities and offers an unequal and negative experience for minorities. We know that racism exists in the world, but more specifically, it exists in the legal field and it impacts the experiences of minority attorneys. These attorneys do not have adequate support and need a place to go for resources and release. Relief. 
Diversity initiatives and affirmative action programs are common within our society. However, diversity initiatives that address the specific needs of minority attorneys, instead of assuming all attorneys require the same diversity initiatives to feel included in the workplace are needed. To better articulate what issues are present in the legal field, I surveyed minority attorneys. Instead of saying systemic racism is an issue as a blanket statement, I wanted to know from attorneys what specific issues they identified as racist and which issues they personally face in their workplace. The goal of this survey was to get a better understanding of what they were experiencing, if they felt comfortable speaking about racial issues in their workplace, and what resources they felt would improve their experiences as a minority. The survey generated 48 responses from attorneys working in law firms, in-house counsel, legal services, and nonprofit entities. In order to provide solutions for minority attorneys, we must first articulate what those issues are. I asked attorneys how systemic racism has impacted them, and one response stated, I only get some opportunities because I am a minority. It is a weird balance between missing out on opportunities completely, but being offered opportunities solely because we are working with minority clients. Another response stated that their firm's attempt to recognize the Asian Heritage Month had nothing to do with celebrating them or Asians and entirely to do with trying to market the firm as, in, as inclusive when they were not. Some stated that they did not feel safe speaking with their HR departments or senior partners about racial issues in their workplace. A few surveys, survey comments asserted that there were no issues in the legal field, that they were just there to work just like everyone else and they're not interested in this topic. There has been too much talk of race. My firm is different than the traditional firms I've worked at. I feel valued here. After taking all of the collect collected data into account, it was clear to me that not all minorities need the same thing. Not all minorities feel that there is a problem. Some minorities are a part of diverse firms who may never experience systemic racism. But for attorneys who do need support within their workplace, I recommend a few solutions to begin improving their workplace environment. First, I recommend creating a safe space. The safe space should be created within a bar association where attorneys can express their issues and be provided with resources. The benefit of having this safe space would be, allow, would be to allow attorneys to seek relief when they do encounter race-related challenges. This space would not replace the function of an HR department, but it would allow minorities to voice their grievances for microaggressions and conduct that should be eliminated from the workplace which would help to improve their experience. The purpose of housing this resource within a bar association would be to bolster the credibility of the safe space. If a national organization who operates in the best interest of all attorneys houses a safe space, they can also show that they care about the experiences of minority attorneys and wish to adopt inclusive practices. The safe space responses would then facilitate the creation of a CLE course. The course would include the collected responses along with the minority attorneys need to feel supported. The goal of the CLE would be to educate both minorities and non-minorities about the issues that their colleagues are facing. And finally, I recommend a public diversity pledge. I also recommend the creation of a public diversity pledge that legal entities can sign and signal to potential employees and the public that they are committed to diversity and making minorities feel safe within their company or a firm. A public diversity pledge would offer attorneys the opportunity to weigh their options for law firms and legal organizations before joining them. By signing the diversity pledge, firms can also show that their commitment to diversity is not a reaction to a racial or political crisis that may be trending, but it can show true dedication to fostering an inclusive environment. By addressing the specific needs of minorities, we can begin to implement an inclusive atmosphere that allows all attorneys to achieve success based on their skills and abilities and not their race. Not all minorities need relief from racial issues, but adequate support should be provided to those who do. I selected this quote because injustice or discriminatory acts during any part of the legal process can impact the client's ability to receive the justice and fairness that they deserve. Since each of our project, projects focuses on different part of the legal process, I believe this quote fits perfectly with each, each of our projects from both the practitioner and the pro se individual's perspective. Thank you.
Shayla, thank you. Um, it is incredibly powerful to think about creating a space, a safe space um, for, for attorneys of color to talk about their experience and um, have that feed into a CLE course to, um, to spread the knowledge of what impacts attorneys of color um, in their workplaces. As we wrap up, um, we're gonna open it up for Q&A, but I just wanna do a huge shout out to all of the fellows who have made tremendous strides in creating ways for us to end systemic racism for the experience from students to getting access to, to law schools, getting into law school, successfully graduating high school, uh, law school, ways that we can serve clients better and improve the professional life of, of um, attorneys of color and all the way to the point of creating legislation that helps end systemic racism. I am so proud of all of you. Thank you for all of the hard work that you and all of the mentors um, who have supported you have done. You are tremendous. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Tina to take Q&A from the audience. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you, everyone. Um, we will now have question and answers. So if you have some questions, please go to the Q&A section, type them in, and we'll give the fellows an opportunity to answer them live. I know there were a couple of questions that have come in and some have started typing them. So I'm going to give you a chance to do that. But before that, I just want to say the African Ancestry Network, and on behalf of them, we had no idea that when we went to our uh, uh, organizational leader, Mike Walsh, and requested to get donations to support causes fighting and projects and causes fighting systemic racism, that the funding that we got for this year being our legacy year doing this contributed to this program and to this fellowship, and that these projects and these these passion projects that you've heard about would result in what we've kind of learned today. And I believe with all that I am that these will be fighting systemic racism and having impact for years to come. So we're so very proud of the opportunity to provide funding for this and just look forward to all of the work to come. So we have a question, let's see here. Um, the first question we have, how do you plan to reach out, not to just people of color, a white attorneys that will encourage them to engage and be part of the of these projects. And I'll open that up to whoever wants to kind of try to answer. So I can start okay. as program director. Um, this summit is a part of that reach out, right? We're recording this webinar. We've opened it up to an external audience. The whole purpose of that is to invite people into the work that we've been doing for the past nine months so that people can be inspired and activate and participate. So it really is a grassroots effort um, because it takes a grassroots effort in addition to programmatic support as well as institutional support to affect these changes. And it, change, it requires a shifting in mindset as well. Um, so events like this is going to be the beginning of it. And I truly believe societal change comes from society. So making sure that people see the work that is being done here, believe in it and decide to further it is gonna advance these efforts. And I think they're just getting started. That's great. Thank you, Adonica. Anyone else? I can also touch on that. <laughs> um, so I would say mainly regards with my project, um, legal vision, um, it allows basically for, you know, white attorneys to seek, you know, if they have a problem or if they want to approach, um, you know, a black attorney and, you know, how do they do that? So that's why I have like, you know, the anonymous Q&A portion on my um, web show is so that they can ask anonymous, feel comfortable to do that, and then also get those, you know, solutions, those answers that they're seeking. Thank you for that, Caitlin. So um, Femi Richards says, these are incredible, ambitious projects, and I applaud your initiative and vision. Looking to the future, where do you see your projects five years from now? I'd like to take that. I'll jump in on that one. Um, five years from now, I'd like to see uh, the HB6U bringing in 30 to 40 um, law students uh, and placing them into internships per year. Um, I see us uh, creating an alumni association centered around HB6U and creating community 
and, and using that, that group to brainstorm new ideas on ways to expand the reach of the HB6U program and ways to improve it. Wendy, I'd love to answer that from the foundation's perspective. Two or three of our fellows here have contacted LexisNexis Rule of Law Foundation to serve as a host for their projects as they work outside of law school, as they move into their careers to establish 501c3s, where their projects will be handed back to them to grow in their own names. Separately, Ms. Darnell, when she passes her legislation, could well be a catalyst to finally getting to Congress because as to real solutions, others will take shape and it will get to the attention of Congress. Thank you for that, Teresa. Another question we have, has your experience in this fellowship shifted your focus as you move forward? I think uh, I'll jump in here. Um, I've you know, decided that I want to practice commercial bankruptcy. So it's still a similar practice, but it's a similar practice area, but it's a different practice. And I think moving forward, I am very much so committed to making sure that for my consumer bankruptcy peers who are practicing, one, that there is representation there. I think that's another big part of uh, my project. So working with people who are interested in learning about bankruptcy and, and being in communities um, and then making sure that my pro bono practice surely includes uh, looking out for individuals who, who are looking for help um, and representation. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Emma. Um, we have another question here. Um, I think Charles would like to answer, but then after that, anyone else that wants to chime in. What areas of law are each of you seeking to practice? Is this predicated upon this, uh, these initiatives? Um, so selfishly, yes. My, my project okay. was focused <laughs> was focused on um, my future goals. I, I hope to to um, start my career as a corporate transaction attorney um, in a large law firm. So I want to make sure that you know doors and open avenues and practices are in place at those firms that will allow me to to grow and develop and to one day becoming a partner. Um, and so it's going to be important um, that people know about these practices, change makers at firms to dovetail back to another question. Some of those change makers actually are white attorneys as well, right? We want to reach across the aisles and pull everybody in that has the power at firms to, to make these changes and create avenues for attorneys of color. Thank you so much for that, Charles. Um, another question that we have um, is, what have you learned about yourself doing this fellowship? I can take that one. Um, I've learned that you know, we are capable of really doing anything that we want to do. Um, it's as simple as, I mean, it's not so simple, it's complicated, but it is quite simple too. having a vision and just having the follow through and the support to bring it to pass. Um, I'm sure I don't just speak for myself and I say that we've learned that we're capable of making change, um, whether or not it starts with a small ripple or, you know, a, a giant drop, a giant uh, drop of some kind of, you know, explosive idea. We're capable of really making change wherever we are. And, and I'll add to that, um, just learning how to tackle something that seems so huge, right? Um, to chip at it bit by bit, piece by piece, and build upon that. And so what we thought was this huge, massive undertaking has become doable, and we're doing it. Mm. That is fantastic. Anyone else? All right, we have another question. What were some unexpected challenges you face? Um, I, I, I think we're all laughing because we can all tell you at least one thing. We can thing. just go around on that one. Yeah. Like that. Um, I was just, I, I really had, it was a challenge that like actually took me back a bit to see the lack of engagement from bankruptcy attorneys. Um, like I gave them data and they were like, okay. Um, and that was a huge challenge that caused me to pivot. Um, and it actually ended up being a blessing in disguise because it helped to focus my, my project even more narrowly than I had initially determined. But 
I had access to these people and they, they didn't choose to participate. So that was a challenge. Anybody else want to share a challenge? Um, I will. <laughs> but it wasn't, um, I'm going to switch it a little bit. So um, I would say that when I was developing this project, I needed speakers. I needed attorneys that were going to willing to share their truth. And I had, you know, my mentor and, you know, the administration on the LexisNexis project, they were like, are, but are attorneys going to want to actually do that? Are they going to want to be vulnerable? Are they going to want to share all of that? And I actually got really great feedback. So an obstacle that was supposed to be an obstacle turned out not to be. And I thought that was amazing to see how much has changed from like, you know, a couple of years ago, like attorneys are willing to speak out because it's the time for it. Uh, I'll I'll say that a challenge I experienced was we came up with a big idea, but it was really important that I followed through with it. And as the project went on, it became apparent that a lot of work goes into creating something. So I gained a, a vast amount of appreciation for individuals that create things. Uh, but it was a challenge once it became real that I had to come to New York <laughs> and uh, make this presentation. Um, and you have conversations with people and, you know, they get really excited and, you know, that's the greatest thing in the world. And inside you're like, yeah, but I don't know if I'm going to get this done. So that was a challenge. Um, and I have to give a tremendous amount of thanks to my mentor, um, who's just always rock solid um, and calm <laughs> and all of the resources that Lexus Next has provided to all of us. Um, we wouldn't be here without them. And I definitely wouldn't have achieved this without them. So we have one last question here, and this is from an anonymous attendee. Having lived in Houston and Harris County, the city county system set up wards, et cetera, itself drives race, driving, drives racism. How do you take on those issues while trying to follow through with these fellowships, or do you take them on with those fellowships? I, I think as someone who currently lives in Harris County, I can I can start there. Um, and I know some of the other fellows have done research in Harris County too, so we can hear from them. Um, I think that I, I take I take that on within the fellowship, right? So the fellowship, the projects that that um, that I worked on, it's a part of me, I, you know. And I hope that the project has a direct impact on on my city, on my county, um, on the wards in Houston, Texas. And so any law firm that has anything to do with Houston, Texas, I hope they come to Thurgood Marshall School of Law and recruit me in Paris, you know, and, and, and the rest of our colleagues there. You know, I hope that they go to the other law schools, uh, U of H in South Texas, and recruit minority law students at those firms as well, because I think it's going to take, um, it's going to take that. It's going to take, you know, having uh, a, a focus to where everybody is chipping in and everybody is addressing the problem together. And that's a good point, uh, Charles. I think, you know, even taking a step back from, you know, Houston and Harris County, I think if you want to be an advocate, go be an advocate. You know, like if you had a cell phone in your hand, uh, you can type a tweet, you can get on Instagram, you know, you can send an email to your local, uh, you know, city council member or congressman or something like that. If you don't have a cell phone, you can write a hand letter and go deliver it to the courthouse. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't take, like having a platform is great, but don't let the plot, don't let the lack of a platform, you know, become the barrier as to why you don't get outside and go advocate. You know what I mean? It doesn't take anything for, you know, you to get like some voter uh, knowledge, you know what I mean? To so like spread awareness about voter suppression. It doesn't take anything to, you know, get uh, some women's rights uh, knowledge, you know, to go spread awareness about, you know, depending uh, uh, rulings in the court right now about abortion and everything else like that. So if you want to be an advocate, you know, jump outside and go do it. The rest will come together. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you for the questions that came in. Thank each of you for your insight. I will say this before turning it over to Adonica to close out. One question came in from Leslie on how can Ellen employees support this fellowship program and ensure the company continues to 
uh, supported in the future. The AAN um, asked for those donations when we went to the various leaderships for a period of five years. And this year, week we actually met to discuss what we would fund for 2022. And it's with honor that we're proud that we're going to continue supporting this fellowship in the same manner that we supported it this year. And um, I'm just excited about the things, the projects and things that can need to be carried on and that the new ideas and things that will come in from the next group of fellows. So we really appreciate you. We're honored to support you and look forward to, you know, all the impact that these uh, passion projects are going to have fighting systemic racism for years to come. Thank you to all. And I turn it back over to you, Adonica. Thank you so much, Tina. So I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon, for joining us on our journey and really diving into what our fellows have accomplished. Um, I invite you all to share the recording of this webinar with your networks, both within LexisNexis and externally, so we can continue to make these dreams come true of eliminating systemic racism and advancing the rule of law in our society and across the world. So thank you very much and have a great afternoon. Thanks.